Hi there, I'm Ginny of the YouTube channel Finickety Reader. How do you feel about books with a lot of controversy around them? A memoir that might be more fiction than non, or a story that turns out to not represent a minority group in a sympathetic light? Does it make a difference if you know going in? I remember reading a book called The Colour of Law by Mark Jimenez, and finding its treatment of African American characters just felt off to my sheltered white middle class sensibilities, but not trusting my own ability to judge it because the world I came from was so different. As it turned out, a quick Google for reviews by people who knew the territory showed me I'd not spotted quite a few other examples of racism in the text. The more you know. I bring this up because I read a book called The Reason I Jump last week. I heard about it from a fellow booktuber who mentioned there had been some controversy because it was quite probably written with something called facilitated communication, and as far as I remember, she didn't feel comfortable commenting on that. But, as someone on the spectrum who likes to do their research, I'd like to try. So, let's go over the basic issues. Facilitated communication is a technique where a neurotypical person, someone who doesn't suffer from a developmental or brain structure abnormality, usually the parent or educator, guides the subject's hand to a keyboard or paper letter board and helps them make themselves understood. The problem is, the technique doesn't stand up to any sort of testing. The methodology they usually use is to put a barrier between the helper and the subject, then show them both an image and ask them what they're being shown. The thing is, they show the helper and the subject different images without their knowledge. What they found was that, when the helper supported the supposed communicator's wrists, they always answered the question with the helper's picture. Now what does that tell you? Now, some of you will respond by calling me a cynic, and saying I'm taking away people's hope. People who are dealing with a child with autism can often feel very alone and stressed. They feel like they're stuck in an unwinnable battle against the side of someone who they're desperate to love. But putting a voice into someone's mouth that isn't their own does a lot more harm than good. If we think we're already communicating with someone, we stop searching for new ways to try. And it's true that some non-verbal people with autism can learn to write, to a varied extent. Autism sacrifices parts of the social mind but can leave a brain able to make connections and detect patterns that allow that learning. Once you dig through the confusion and the noise of everyday life, that's where we need to concentrate our research. But so little has been published in this country about how Naoki Higashida communicates, at least in English, that we can't say for certain which he is. David Mitchell says he's seen him communicate, without details, but the guy's an author, not a scientist, and one of those scared parents so I have to take what he says with a grain of salt. I so hope that Naoki is one of those second group, who's found a way to talk on his own and make himself understood. But so much tomfoolery has gone before, that many won't believe it till they see it. The second issue comes back to David Mitchell himself. Translating from one language to another is hard enough, but this piece of work is also translating from one understanding of the world to another, and we really don't know how much of David is in this book. So, that's the controversy. Now for the review. The Reason I Jump is set out as 58 questions and Naoki's answers to them. Some of the questions are quite vague, in a way that I'd struggle with, but if he knew what he meant, that wouldn't surprise me. These are questions you might not specifically put to Naoki. He says more than once that he doesn't suffer from a particular problem, but he tries his best to answer them. But that's one of the problems. Naoki, at least the way he's translated here, has a tendency to vastly overgeneralize and use the pronoun we when maybe he shouldn't. For someone on the spectrum, this can be like if you go to a restaurant and someone insists on ordering for you. We'll have the red wine, if you please, garçon. Mm, but I, I don't drink and I'm on antibiotics. We like red wine. Hmm. <laughs> What really comes across in this book is that it's written to a neurotypical world and, to a large extent, parents. It's positioned as a letter to them from the world of autism, what their child would tell them if only they could, and obviously there's an audience for this kind of thing. But we really need to recognise that every person who has autism is different, 
just like every person is different. Our personality, our culture, our life experience has as much of an effect on us as our autism. And not even that hits every person in the same way. But I want to end this on a happy note. So hear this. The way we see people with autism has changed a lot since the days we locked them away in sanitariums. And this clamour to hear own voices feels like a move in the right direction. And that search for a glimmer of understanding, a spark of reciprocity, may lead us down some blind alleys, but it may also help us find it when it's there. I hope you found this video interesting, and you're having fun reading. You can like, subscribe, or be my friend on Goodreads if you want to. I'll talk to you later.